Hi everyone, welcome to another video on the wrestling saga. In today's video, we'll be covering the latest episode of AEW Dark Elevation, which aired about a day ago. As always, if you're interested in knowing the wins and losses, please look over here. After a few seconds, once you guys have seen, that's when we'll start discussing each and every match in detail. Okay, starting with the first match, it was Chuck Taylor from Best Friends versus Ray Phoenix of the Death Triangle. It seems that the Death Triangle is hell bent on taking out each and every member of the Best Friends faction. They're trying to systematically dismantle it in one sense. I like this match because it showed two people with different styles of wrestling. A high flyer against an on-ground and relatively orthodox wrestler who comes with a slight twist. While the pace of the match was initially a little slow, Chuck certainly was no pushover. While Alex Abrahantes did try to uh, interrupt the match and probably cost Chuck his attention within the match, matters got sorted due to Orange Cassidy's arrival, which again didn't really work in the best friend's favour because that's when Penta came and landed a full face kick on Orange Cassidy, thereby taking him down. Ray eventually won the match in a manner which was probably embarrassing to Chuck given Ray's uh, pin style. I wonder what are the best friends gaining from this from this feud considering that they are down 2 out of 3 matches based on the assumption that if we had uh, Trent against Penta, we had Chuck against Phoenix then we'll probably have uh, Orange Cassidy against Pac in the near future. The next match we saw Ryan Nemeth against Ryzen. I like Ryzen by this point. I did not know that hell proves as a source of motivation and inspiration for some person like Ryzen. Because Ryzen continues to carry on regardless of how many losses he sees in tag team matches or singles matches. Heck, even on vlogs he's starting to have a bad time given the recent Blue Pills incident. Coming to the match just when we thought that Ryzen had an upper hand, that's when he got distracted by Peter Avalon and fell into Ryan Nemeth's finisher, thereby losing the match. Ryan Nemeth, in fact, while executing his finisher, had enough time to in fact stitch a full three-piece suit. That's how much long he had while executing his finisher move on Ryzen. I found that funny in a certain way. Anyhow, it's good for the pretty boy squad. And yes, I'm calling them a squad, not a gang, because I feel gang is an overused word. Ryzen, may he not rest in peace because he needs to get a victory. It's been a very long time for him. His losing streak is great by this point. Next, we had a match involving Orange Cassidy and Dean Alexander. Like his previous singles match, this was a quick one for Orange Cassidy. Dean Alexander attempted him to leave tag team matches for once. Came out with what I believe was a new persona, a fur coat and talking about something which I couldn't really hear given the way the camera was placed in the ring outside the ring. But that did really make an impact. The match was wrapped up in a reasonably quick time. So Cassidy is on a roll and Dean, I think he needs some time off with Sam to go off and kill some demons so as to cheer himself up. And yes, that's a supernatural joke for those who get it. We then had a short segment involving uh, Peter Avalon, Cesar Benoni, Ryan Nemec and the blue collar badass JD. The Pretty Boy Squad finally got JD to wear something fancy, which well was something different. The blue collar badass was certainly green in the fashion department and in fact, he could have been a subject of an entire episode had this been another promotion and had the fashion files still been in existence. By the way, they were amazing. I miss them. The Acclaimed then had a tag team match against a new tag team, Liam Gray and Adrian Alanis. The pre-match rap by Max Caster was better than the match itself. I don't have much comments beyond this. I didn't really enjoy the match. It was okay, but I just didn't feel too much invested into it. Then there was a Dark Order segment, which was basically based on Five and Alex Reynolds preparing for a tag team match against the new tag team of Scorpio Sky and All Ego Ethan Page. While their confidence and their observation on how Ethan and Scorpio spent a lot of time just complaining about things rather than indulging in actions, while that was correct, I could already fear what was coming ahead. 
and that's something we'll talk about as this video progresses. Nick Omarado then had a match against VSK. So Nick's huge and his traps are awesome. They are insane. Nick for some reason reminds me of the mutant gang leader from the Batman animated film. But instead of being the mutant leader on the operating table while Batman dislocates his uh, joints and breaks his bones, he actually has the role of Batman because that's the kind of treatment he gives to his opponents, which in this case was VSK who was returning after a certain amount of absence from AW Dark in the past few weeks. So Nick enters this match, constructs that makeshift throne for QT Marshall to sit on, starts bashing up VSK and then once QT Marshall gives him the signal, Nick ends the match with a finisher and after the match he applies a second finisher just to show off or probably flex because he has literally quite a lot of muscles. This is only good because they are building up Nick to be that undefeated monster. It sort of reminds me in a certain sense of Umaga. Let's see what they do in terms of his feuds later on. That will be interesting to see. Because you've got a slick fellow in terms of Aaron Solo. You've got a technician in the form of Anthony Agogo. Then you've got the monster, that's Nick. And then you've got the strategist, the leader, which is QT. Then we had a promo from Leila Hirsch. I like these segments because they help us understand a wrestler better. It helps us get a bit more insight into the individual themselves. While I knew she was Russian, I did not know that she was adopted and then eventually grew up with her adoptive parents in US. I also didn't know that she left a scholarship just to pursue her dream of wrestling, which she came to know of at the age of 14. Those are interesting things and this makes me get more uh, invested into the wrestler themselves. Amber Nova and Diamante then had a tag team match against Ryo Mizunami and Leila Hirsch. Leila and Ryo won this match pretty easily because Amber and Diamante didn't really seem that much in sync. I kind of feel bad for Diamante because she already had a certain chemistry with uh, Ivelisse who as of now has left AEW, apparently on a sour note. While Amber Nova looks great in terms of her appearance, her height and her abs, she did this weird thing wherein she probably oversold the chops of Ryo Mizunami a bit too much. They are certainly continuing the trend of Leila Hirsch getting her victories by submission holds and being a technician within the ring. And if you've seen some of my previous videos, that's what I appreciate. I like this role that she's getting into. It sort of fits her persona, it also fits her style and definitely it fits her experience being someone who's been in traditional wrestling before she started professional wrestling. Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page then had an interview with Dasha Fuentes wherein they were having their first argument about the name of their team, which was cute because while Scorpio Sky wanted the team's name to be Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky, Ethan Page wanted the name of the team to be Scorpio Sky and Ethan Page. So it's two narcissists who are not being a narcissist only on one topic and that's the name of the team. So tolerably cute if I can call it that. Tesha Price then had a match against Chris Tatlander. I finally figured it out who Tesha reminds me of. She's like the female version of Luther, only in terms of how loudly sh she shrieks. She doesn't even shout or yell, she shrieks and she reminds me of the character of Banshee in the DC Universe. So if ever on the DC uh, TV shows, if they need the casting for Banshee, they should consider Tesha just because of the pitch with which she can shriek. No offense beyond that, she seems to be a decent wrestler, but dude, I've got sensitive ears and when she shrieks, it bothers me. That aside, the match was alright. It did more of a favor to Chris, showing that she not only has the strength, but also the technique. Which is something that I'm seeing in an increasing amount of wrestlers within AEW. Is this by design or is this just the evolution of the industry at the promotion level? I don't know, but I'm, ex I'm excited to be an audience to it. Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky then finally had their match against Five and Alex Reynolds and as was expected, they won the match. They did have to in fact win the match so I get that part. So while this was a good match, I find it difficult to like it because the Dark Order lost. And I'm seeing a trend that with the exception of 3-man and 4-man tag matches, Dark Order is generally losing matches these days and that's what concerns me. Of course, the exception is Hangman Page. He's the only one who wins individual matches and he's kinda sorta the member of Dark Order by this point. 
Big Soul and Red Velvet had a tag team match against Maddie Rinkowski and Nyla Rose accompanied with uh, Vicky Guerrero. This was a weird match from the get-go. Big Soul and Red Velvet were as is their normal selves. Maddie Rinkowski had a new persona in which she was timid, reserved while being in the company of Nyla and Vicky Guerrero. This was sort of sudden, probably because she had lost a tag team match with Nyla in the past, in the recent past too. Throughout the match, Nyla Rose attempted to control it by calling clear moves and shots and giving instructions, clear instructions to Maddie. In between, when, when Maddie Rinkowski chose to not follow Nyla's instructions, probably to prove herself so as to win the match, and then having her approach backfire, that's when Nyla Rose entered the ring and promptly powerbombed Maddie and then left her to be pinned by the opposing team, essentially handing over the match while also abandoning it and walking away with Vicky Guerrero. This was, like I said at the beginning of the segment, a bit weird. Probably more context before this thing happened would have been good. I mean, I understand Maddie was sort of testing their nerves already, but you don't just powerbomb your member and leave, abandon the match. The only other person who's done it so far is QT, I believe. What happens after this is something I'm curious about because I think it'll be dropped and then this entire storyline will not really make much sense. So it was, eh, okay. But Matt Seidel then had the main event match against Joey Janela. Both these guys are great. It was more of a technical hold related match that tested the stamina and the chop absorption ability of both the men. In fact, this is the kind of match that makes Elevation a fantastic show. Because due to various reasons, we can't get such matches by such individuals on Dynamite frequently. Given that you need to accommodate everyone and you need to accommodate various storylines also on Dynamite. In fact, throughout the match, another thing that I liked was that both men had a spirit of sportsmanship. They appreciated each other, they uh, fist bumped, and even after Matt Seidel won the match, he bowed down to Joy Janela as a mark of respect. This match was good because it helped show the strengths, the wrestling style, the persona of both these men greatly. I feel such matches don't do injustice to anyone at their end. I love this main event and because of such matches, my faith in Elevation continues. I look forward to seeing Elevation shows in the future also. That's all the thoughts I had with respect to the latest episode of Elevation. I hope you all found it helpful. As always, I hope you, your loved ones are safe and sound. Take care and see you all soon. Bye-bye.